I said this was going to be challenging, and it is. But let's start with some things that you undoubtedly have recognized yourself that occur on the landscape. Why are car dealerships so frequently concentrated together and also generally very near freeways? Why aren't two McDonald's next to each other or across the street from each other? Why do major supermarket chains like Vaughn's or Ralph's or Albertson's, why do they tend to be spread apart and not right next to each other, two Vaughn's right next to each other? Why are some restaurants, especially small non-chain restaurants, concentrated together? Why are gas stations usually on corners? Think about it, you got two streets coming together. Maximize customers. Why are shopping malls almost always in easy access to freeways? Are these things random or are they planned? Look at this map. Remember, a critically important component of geography is distribution along with patterns, density, and concentration. Do you see any patterns on this map of the United States, a composite of satellite photos showing the cities and of course the illuminated areas? Do you see any patterns? Let's take a look. The US population is concentrated along the coastlines, even along the Great Lakes. And the coastal cities like LA, Los Angeles, which is in the Bronze Arrow, or I'm pointing it out with the Bronze Arrow, New York City, which I pointed out with the white arrow, Miami pointed out with the red arrow, Boston with the blue arrow, and then Chicago with the green arrow are all elongated. It means they're stretched out because they're pressed up against the coastline. Take a look at the map to the upper right and you can see the blue circles, a little bit different, okay? So as the cities along the coast grew, they couldn't grow out in the ocean, so they sort of stretched out. The yellow boxes on that map are cities that are stretched out along railway lines, so lines of transportation. And the blue circles are more concentrated urban centers that are not coastal and that act as focal points for their regions. So here we go. In the first half of the 20th century, there was a German geographer named Walter Christaller. And Walter Christaller developed a model or a concept that he called central place theory. Now this was based largely on what he saw occurring on the German landscape, which was a regularity of the spacing of cities. And central place theory basically says this, that a service needs to maximize its accessibility by being around the greatest number of potential customers. I know that this seems very logical because it is very logical. And Chris Dollar recognized what he called the market area. This is the area from which a business can expect to draw customers. So just think yourself, how far are you willing to drive to buy a pair of shoes or a couch or an automobile? And when you go to purchase those things, do you want choices or do you know exactly what you want before you go hunting these things down? How far are you willing to go to eat at a restaurant? So Chris Toller recognized that smaller urban areas could draw customers in different ways than larger urban areas could draw customers. And essentially he ranked cities based on the services they provided. In smaller cities, there were some services available, but customers would need to travel for others. And I'll go through this more in more detail momentarily, but it would be something like this. In a small city, there might be a medical clinic, but no hospital. There might be a gas station repair shop, but no auto dealership. There might be a movie theater, but no live theater. And there might be a high school, but no real university. But larger urban areas would offer the full range of services. 
and that would allow them to draw customers from a larger area. Basically, what he did was this. He created a kind of threshold for his model. And this is the number of people that were needed for a business or an activity to remain active and prosperous. So in other words, to make money. And so what Chris Stoller did was he created a kind of order, low order and high order goods and cities for that matter. Low order goods are things that can be replenished frequently, things like food or you know the things that you need for your household like cleansers or something like that. And since people have to buy these things regularly, small businesses in small towns are able to sur survive because people who live near the small towns are gonna buy these things frequently. And as a result of that, the businesses can stay open. But higher order goods that are kind of more specialized like automobiles, furniture, expensive jewelry, I don't know, household appliances like a refrigerator or a stove or a washing machine, you don't buy these things as frequently as you buy bread. And as a result of that, those types of businesses have to draw from a bigger area. They require a larger threshold, more people in order to survive. And as a result of that, you're going to have to go a greater distance and they tend to concentrate in larger urban areas where you have a bigger population that can go in and purchase these products. So they can draw from a bigger market area. Now, central place theory kind of combines a lot of things, urban geography, urban planning, economic geography, cultural geography, even physical geography because of the landscape. So what the landscape looks like. Chris Stoller was assuming the landscape basically is flat and uniform and that people are rational and they're going to purchase services that are closest to them. This is the most complicated version of his concept of his model. And remember, it's a model. It's not going to be precise. It's giving you an idea of the way things work. But if you look down over here, you can see that this is a city right here. And you can see that that represents a city. And notice this is different from the town. The city has that kind of lighter color surrounding it on the outside, whereas the town has the darker color surrounding it. So here's the city. And what he said is that within the confines of this particular hexagon, that's where the businesses within that city could expect to draw customers, okay? Now here's what the town looks like. Here's a town right here. And what he said is that within this hexagon, the businesses inside this town could expect to draw customers, okay? And then this is what a village looks like, okay? See the village? So here's a village right here, and the village could expect to have customers coming into it from that hexagon. And then finally, the smallest thing, what he called a hamlet, which is a very, very, very small town. Okay, the hamlet would be like that small dot right there, and it could expect to draw customers from this smaller area. Okay, so the larger the urban structure, the larger its area can expect to draw customers, and the smaller the urban area, the smaller the area it can expect to draw customers from. And of course, that's going to set up whether a business is going to make it or not. So why hexagons? Hexagon is a six-sided object, right? So what he said is this that let's assume that this is the city. He was saying that, for example, people would be willing to drive five miles, so come from five miles into the city to be able to buy the services and the products that are available in that city. I'm just making up the number five. And if that's uniform all around, that's going to create a circle. Okay, but when you set up a whole bunch of circles that are all service areas, the problem is that they don't overlap. And there's this area here that is unserved, okay? And then these people are going to be unserved and they're gonna to have to drive a greater distance or transport themselves a greater distance. So when you overlap the circles, now what happens is you have these overlapping areas where the people who live in those overlapped gray areas, they can either go to this city or to this city to get services. But you know he wanted to really make this a tight model. And so what he did was this, he connected the areas where the circles touch. And by doing that, you can see that what happens when you connect them is you begin to create hexagons. And this is the reason that it's hexagonal in nature. So this is a less complicated version of it. So let's go through this less complicated version. So you can see that that's a hexagon. You can see the hexagons repeat all across this model. So I'm starting with the small, with the hamlet, the smallest 
version of, a, of an urban development. And you can see a bunch of red arrows are pointing at a whole variety of these little black dots, which represent hamlets. Now, the only place that there's hexagons around them are these two up here, which means that that hamlet can draw from people within that hexagon, this hamlet within that hexagon. And you can see it's a simplified model, so that this way there's not just hexagons all over, which makes it like a spider web and almost impossible to see what's happening. Now you can see that I circled village, which is the kind of white circle, and I have red arrows pointing to a number of villages. What this means is that, for example, with this village right here, it can draw customers from within that hexagon, this village from within that hexagon, and so on. And now you can see the towns. So now we're getting to more services. And he doesn't, once again, on this model, doesn't have all of the hexagons, but you can see the red hexagon here is for that particular town. But any of these uh, blue circles would be towns with the same size hexagon. And then you can see there's only one city on this model, and that one city is right there. And that one city can draw from that blue right there there that would be its market area okay now i just drew a purple highlighting around that hexagon so you can see so that means that that red circle the city can draw from that spatial area that's its market area that's where businesses can expect to get customers from now you can see with the town i put one purple hexagon on there now i put another one on there so those towns can draw from that market area and now you can see that i highlighted the hexagons around some of the villages in purple and you can see that those hexagons indicate the market area for the villages and of course you can see this repeated all over on this particular diagram and now you can see with regard to the hamlet up here in this upper left hand corner you can see that there's a hexagon right there and there's one, another one right next to it now i put several other hexagons on there those are the market areas so much smaller than for example with the city this is another version of this where the hamlets and the villages are combined, lower order, whereas the town, intermediate order, city, higher order, which means all the services are going to be available. In a village, only some of them are going to be available. And you can see, once again, I highlighted it where the red representing the city has a red hexagon around it, the blue representing the town has a blue hexagon around it, and the green representing the village has a green hexagon around it. Now you can see that's their market areas. And notice that they're overlapping. So it's going to depend on what you need and where you want to go and how close you are. This is another version of this model. So you can see it gets very complicated. Here's a back to that same original version. So once again, you can see the hexagons. Just take each piece of it and you can see what the market area is rather than trying to look at the whole thing at once and it gets very confusing very quickly. So what is the impact of the internet done to this? Has the internet basically destroyed this? Does it make in-person shop, in -person shopping obsolete? Well, I mean, I don't really think so. Experience matters, right? If you're going out to a restaurant, you're going out to have an experience at a restaurant, not just eat at the restaurant. I personally, because I've jogged much of my life, I really need to put shoes on before I buy them. So I don't buy my shoes on the internet. I'm kind of like that with most clothing also. I wanna try most clothing on to make sure it fits me. I'm 6'3", so sometimes things don't fit right in the sleeves. I am definitely not going to buy an automobile without having driven the automobile several times. So I'm willing to transport myself over to check the automobile out. And there's a number of other things that kind of operate like that. So you can see that the internet, while it has obliterated some of this, it's not gonna wipe it all out because there is going to always be some kind of in-person shopping. And people, of course, want experiences with a lot of things they do. You know, watching something on a TV screen is not the same as going to a movie theater, which is not the same as live theater.